everybody. Um, my name is Laurence Coderre. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here um, at the center. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the second presentation in the new lecture series of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies for the 2016 winter term. Um, so just a few announcements before we get started. The next presentation will take place a week from today on Tuesday, February 9th, um, and will be given by our very own Yasmin Cho, also an LRCCS postdoc, um, and she'll be speaking on architectural versus improvisational thinking, hut and tent building practices of Tibetan Buddhist nuns in post Mao China. Um, at this point, if I could ask you to take a moment to turn off your cell phones uh, for the duration of the talk, that would be much appreciated. Um, now, without further ado, I want to introduce today's speaker. Today's presentation will be given by Jeffrey Moser, who's Assistant Professor of History of Art and Architecture in Asian Art History at Brown University. Uh, his research focuses on the artistic and intellectual history of China during the Song era which is about the 10th to 13th centuries AD. Um, and he uh, pays particular attention to the problems of ritual, language, and factor. He's currently completing a book on the rediscovery of classical bronzes in the 11th century. So today he'll be speaking to us on schema and substance in the Northern Song Vessel. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Moser. So, uh, can I, oh, this is back on again, good. Um, so I'd like to begin my talk uh, today by thanking uh, the Center for Chinese Studies, uh, Lawrence Coderre, for inviting me, and Ina Schlorf especially for doing such a wonderful job with all of the arrangements. And also all of you for coming here to listen to me talk. Um, this, on, a, on what may sound like a, a highly antiquarian subject, I, I confess that it is a highly antiquarian subject, but I hope that I will make it slightly less antiquarian and slightly more relevant, hopefully, to some of the work or some of the problems you may be thinking about in the context of the next 45 minutes. Um, what I'm going to present here today is a very small piece of a much larger project on the agency of ancient bronzes in the intellectual life of northern Song China. Uh, for those of you who don't have those dates on the, you know, at the forefront of your mind, that's 960 to 1127 AD. Now, as at least uh, a couple faculty members here at Brown have written upon some of the materials that I'll be mentioning, I'm not sure if I see them in the audience, um, I'm hopeful that there will be um, a productive dialogue in uh, the Q&A. Now, one of the central challenges of art historical research is to articulate the complex array of forces that make an object look the way it does. To articulate, in other words, the cognitive, technical, and material constituents of a thing, or to borrow a term popularized by Alfred Gell about 20 years ago, to elucidate the object as a nexus of distinctive agencies. Most of the bitter disputes in the field of art history, if traced to their source, arise from disagreements about which agency or group of agencies has priority in explaining what our eyes see. These debates are essentially hermeneutic debates, debates over which interpretive paradigm should have priority. Now, it seems to me that the great challenge of the field these days, uh, which scholars across the various sub-disciplines of art history and actually beyond in the humanities have been engaged in, is the challenge of allowing our objects of inquiry to generate, or at least contribute, to the formulation of the hermeneutics through which we come to understand them. 
Now, one way to characterize this focus on the object and the mechanisms of its making is to say that what art historians are engaged in today is a renewed hermeneutics of facture, in which interpretive approaches, appro approaches? approaches, thank you, um, approaches are directed by the traces of mechanical processing preserved in the fabric of the thing. Now, the work that I'm presenting here today constitutes, to my mind, one small aspect of this much broader endeavor. And what I'm about to present is an attempt to begin thinking about how close engagement with the formal properties of a single object can inflect our reading of the historical context in which it is situated, and in so doing, shift in subtle ways our understanding of the wider history of which it is a tiny part. So the object in question is this bronze, bronze cauldron. The vessel is quite small, measuring a mere nine inches in height. It features a pair of looped handles that rise vertically from its rim, uh, three unadorned cylindrical legs, and a deep body with cast adornment in low relief. Oops, sorry. When we look at the vessel in the round, we see that this decor is divided into three registers, separated from one another by a sim simple vertical flange. Now, each of these registers is dominated by the image of a monstrous face peering out at us through two bulbous, unblinking eyes. Now, although this motif will no doubt be familiar to many in this room, I'm going to refrain from identifying it for the moment and talk simply about its most salient formal features. Uh, now, the first and most striking of these is the very clear distinction between the figure and the ground. The form of the face is clearly distinguished from the surrounding field by the contrast between its smooth, descriptive surface and the repetitive geometry of the tightly wound spirals that surround and engulf it. As you can see from the fine lines of shadow and highlighting that follow the perimeter of the face, the figure is also in slightly higher relief than the surrounding spirals. The coherence of the figure is further enhanced by the zoomorphic legibility of its features. The raised spirals just above the leg read as nostrils. The hooked crescents on either side of the face read as claws. The coiled forms extending from the brows on either side as a serpentine body. The volutes above the brows read as horns. And the protuberance between the horns reads as the creature's forehead. Now, although aspects of the figure are highly geometricized, all remain organically interrelated and consistently zoomorphic in character. Now, we know a bit about this vessel because of a cast inscription on the bottom of its interior written in archaic seal script. In an important study uh, published in 2001, Chun Fa Mei deciphered this inscription, and what you are looking at here is a transliteration of that inscription into standard script. Now, the presence of this inscription, which securely dates the piece to the Zheng He reign of the northern Song Emperor Huizong, has made this diminutive vessel one of the most famous later Chinese bronzes in existence. The cauldron was included in the great splendors of Imperial China show of masterpieces from the collection of the National Palace Museum that toured the United States in 1996 and 97. Um, and it's been featured prominently in studies of collecting and ritual reform at the Northern Song Court by scholars such as the aforementioned Cheng Fa Mei, as well as Li Ling, Xu Ya Hui, Yun Chen Sena, Patricia Ibri, and so on and so forth. Um, now, in most of the published literature on this vessel, most of the scholarship, the key feature that um, is most frequently discussed is its archaism. In other words, the fact that it closely resembles in shape and decor the cast bronze ritual cauldrons from ancient China that we all know. Now, just for reference, what I'm showing here is a late Shang Dynasty cauldron from the collection of the Shanghai Museum, whose design closely approximates that of the Northern Song Cauldron. Now, we know that the court artisans responsible for the design and casting of the vessel had access to ancient prototypes because Song elites, both private literati and the imperial court, had been collecting and cataloging ancient bronzes for decades prior to the casting of this cauldron in 1116. What you're looking at here is an example of a Shang Dynasty cauldron and an illustration of a similar cauldron from the 18th century Suku Chen Shu edition of Lu Dalin's famous and influential Illustrated Investigations of Antiquity. 
Now, Hui Zong's own court catalog of bronzes, which was completed just a few years after the cauldron that we've been looking at, um, known as the Bogutu, or Manifold Antiquities Illustrated, um, features more than 800 of the several thousand ancient bronzes that are estimated to have filled Hui Zong's court collection at its heyday. And just as a caveat here, I wanted to point out that all of the ancient bronzes that you're showing here are not bronzes that actually came from those court collections. With one or two exceptions, every bronze that was recorded in either the Kaogutu Lu Dalin's catalog or uh, the Hui Zong's court catalog are lost. Bronze does not survive very well above the ground. And um, so what I've done is select more recently excavated bronzes that closely approximate the images that we're seeing in these catalogs. The proliferation, the, the, the proliferation of ancient bronze imagery stimulated a wave of now very well documented archaism in Song material culture. Again, this is an area that has seen quite a bit of publication in recent years. Scholars like Rose Kerr, Robert Maori, Li Ling again, Han Wei, Cheng Fan Mei, Xie Ming Liang, Xi Yahui, and so forth. Now, virtually all arche archaistic vessels of the Song period feature fusions of ancient and more contemporary forms. As such, one could say that a characteristic feature of these vessels is that they are polytemporal. Two recent discoveries that have, been, that have not been featured in uh, earlier scholarship to any significant degree, but which showcase this polytemporal quality are this group of matching bronze uh, incense burners, very small incense burners, uh, that have been discovered at three different sites uh, in China in recent years, um, in which archaistic designs are applied to a much more contemporary body. And this ceramic vessel, which was recently discovered from the cemetery of Lu Dalid himself's family, um, that it was excavated between 2009 and 2012 uh, in Lan Tian Shanxi, <laughs> and um, which, where we see the form of a Western Zhou Gui vessel rendered in contemporary celadon glazed stoneware. Now, what I would like to do today is to begin a conversation about how we might move beyond archaism as a term for such features. Archaism works well as a contemporary term of visual analysis, and it helps articulate relationships between objects in chronological time. But it doesn't necessarily explain how what we now see as archaistic features were understood in the context of their own time in a context where other kinds of cyclical, non-chronological time dominated discourse. So what I'd like to do is inquire into the characteristically polytemporal features of Song archaistic vessels and ask what those features might have meant to the people who made them. Now, our cauldron is an ideal object for this kind of inquiry because although they are not actually easy to see, uh, it does indeed feature several polytemporal features. Um, for my purposes today, I'm going to focus on just two of these features. And the first one has to do with the vertical flanges. Now, as you will note, the bronze on the left, we can see three of them here, has a total of six vertical flanges that divide it into six separate registers, which bifurcate the image of the face. Um, as Max Ler observed decades ago, this has the effect of generating a sort of visual ambiguity that makes it difficult to tell whether you are looking at a single creature staring out at you or two creatures confronting one another in profile. Uh, this ambiguity provided a form of precedent for the disintegration of the face into symmetrical birds or other zoomorphic profiles in some later bronzes. Now, in a very thoughtful reading of the Huizong bronze, Yun Shen Sena has observed that the flange has been removed. So instead of six flanges, we have only three, thereby eliminating this sense of ambiguity. What the viewer sees on the Hui Zong cauldron on the right is unquestionably a single face staring out. Now, what I would like to do is essentially double down on Sena's reading by noting that the Sung cauldron eliminates not only the flange, 
but indeed all of the ancillary, vaguely figurative imagery that was so common on early bronzes in favor of a single, coherent, and unified zoomorphic form. So just to use our example here, the sort of imagery that I'm talking, being, uh, talking about being eliminated uh, includes things like the vaguely leaf-like triangles on the legs, the plumed crest above the creature's brow, the strange knife-like plumes that jut from its elbows, and so forth. All of this hard to identify finery is eliminated, leaving a single coherent zoomorph. So that's the first feature. Now the second feature I want to talk about is actually just the inscription itself, which unequivocally identifies the vessel as being of contemporary rather than ancient craftsmanship. It also, and this is key, gives it a name. It refers to it as a Xingding. Now I'll return to the significance of this name in a moment. But what I would first like to propose is that we should understand these two polytemporal properties as traces of two distinctive cognitive processes that went into the making of the cauldron and are, to a significant measure, responsible for its form. And for the purposes of our discussion today, I'd like to refer to these processes as semiotic individuation and ritual nominalization. So what do I mean by those perhaps overly complicated terms. Oops, sorry. Um, semiotic individuation essentially refers to the elimination of multivalence, or what we might call the chatter of ambiguous form. Fundamentally reductive, it is essential to the process of taxonomizing that happens in the construction of any system of categories. Now, what is fascinating is that we see this same process of semiotic individuation that we're seeing on the on the bronze happening in the court's catalog of bronzes itself. Uh, we see it happening, of course, in the overall organization of the catalog according to a formal typology. But what's even more interesting is that we see it happening in the prefaces that have been attached to each of these typological categories. So to give you just an example, here's a passage from that court catalog. It reads, by anal by analogizing and scheming them, the sages prepared all the multitudinous things and thus comprehended the virtue of divine clarity and thereby cataloged the sentiments of the myriad things. Thus they made round cauldrons as schema for yang, square cauldrons as schema for ying, three legs as schema for the three dukes, four legs as schema for the four supporting ministers, yellow handles as schema for median talent, and a metal bar as a schema for extreme talent. They schemed the Tautia to warn against its greed. They schemed the long-tailed monkey to lodge their wisdom. Now the key term here is this word shang, which I'm sure anyone who reads Chinese is familiar with and will immediately remark that it shouldn't be translated schema, it should in fact be translated something like image or figure. Um, and I'll come back to why in this particular instance I find it appropriate to translate this term as schema. Um, but essentially, the key thing to remember here is that we're looking at an, 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 an analogizing process. There you go. Um, now, without worrying about the content of these analogies that we're seeing in this passage, the key is that they are constructing one-to-one -one relationships between each of the physical features on the bronzes that they are cataloging and some other entity in the world, whether it be a cosmological principle, administrative office, or a moral admonishment. And so let's us return here to the question of the zoomorph's identity. Now most of you are no doubt aware that the conventional term in contemporary English scholarship for this motif is the Tautia, an ancient name of a mythical beast that was so ravenous the gods took away its body in punishment. An alternate version suggests that it, that it actually consumed its own body, but we'll leave that aside for a moment. Um, the earliest written record we have of the name Tautia being used in conjunction with bronzes comes from the third century BC Lucia Chuncio. And it actually, it's not actually until the 11th century AD and the writings of the antiquarian Li Ling that the form is indubitably linked to what we see here on the bronze. Whether or not the name appropriately represents 
the way the figure was understood in Shang and Zhou times, uh, whether it is even accurate to interpret the figure principally as an icon with a fixed iconographic identity is the subject of one of the fiercest, longest-running debates in the historiography of Chinese art. And if we had a few more hours, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But um, what we can say here for sure is that when this vessel was cast in the early 12th century AD, that identification was well established. What I would like to argue is that the unambiguous identification of the motif as a tautia that emerged in the 11th century contributed to a new level of unambiguity in design, which encouraged the artisans responsible for the cauldron to eliminate the chatter of superfluous form that might encourage the viewer to see something other than a tautia on the surface of the vessel. This also helps to explain, I think, um, the organic unity and coherent zoomorphism of the figure. So to sum up, the stabilization of an iconographic reading contributed to the stabilization of the design, and it reflected the emerging notion of each element of bronze design as having a fixed symbolic identity. This is what I mean by semiotic individuation. All right. Now, a second way in which the identity of a classical form was fixed was through what I'm calling ritual nominalization. Now, to understand what I mean by this term, we have to turn to the question of ritual hermeneutics and the 2,000-year-old problem of names. The basic nature of this problem is as follows. Since the Han Dynasty canonization of the three ritual classics, which I've listed here, the Record of Rites, the Rites of Joe, and the Book of Etiquette and Ceremony, which purport to uh, describe the harmonious ritual order that reigned in the golden age of the early Western Zhou dynasty, exegetes had been concerned with elaborating the terse liturgical records in the classics um, into workable manuals for actual ritual. In other words, the ritual learning that um, evolved from the Han dynasty and continues in some quarters to this day um, involved, involved both exegesis on the ritual classics and the adaptation of these classics and other precedents into manuals for ritual practice at court and ultimately for society in general. The hermeneutics deployed in this process of interpretation and adaptation are highly complex, and there was considerable disagreement during Song times about the appropriate ways of adapting antique ritual to present times, which are fascinating but unfortunately beyond the scope of what I have time to talk about here. Um, fortunately, one of the foremost experts in this material, Professor Christian DePay, um, is here at Michigan, and so I'm confident that you have had or will have other opportunities to hear about this fascinating set of materials. Um, the synopsis of ritual hermeneutics that I'll be discussing today is informed in part by his work. Now, within the context of ritual practice, the problem of names is essentially a problem of facture. In other words, it's a problem of making. The ritual classics are filled with the names of things um, that fulfill vital functions in the li liturgies that they uh, record. So names like Yi, Jue, Ding, and Zun. Now the problem was that by the Han Dynasty, the actual forms that corresponded to these names had been forgotten. Um, it might actually be more accurate to state that those forms had never existed as coherently as the classics represented them in the first place, um, and that the names had never quite been quite as stable as later exegetes wanted them to be. But in any case, it was all well and good for later exegetes and ritual specialists to exhort the court to use a jue or a zun in performing ancient rituals. But in order to make that happen in practice, the court's craftsmen needed to know what a jue or a zun was supposed to look like. Um, so in order to stabilize these names and associate them in a one-to-one -one relationship with a fixed form that could be reproduced, an elaborate hermeneutics based on a mixture of textual interpretation and ritual precedence was developed. Now, as you might imagine, there were endless debates about which texts to interpret which way and which precedents to make precedent. Um, and had we the rest of the afternoon, we could get into it. But the key text uh, that mattered most for the way these questions played out in the Song is Nye Chongyi's illustrations of the three ritual classics, 
which was built on the backs of a thousand years of exegetical commentary. Now, Nip provided comprehensive uh, illustrations and dimensions for all of the various and sundry vestments, vessels, and other ritual implements named in the classics, over 450 discrete il illustrations. So just to give a few examples, here we see an e-vessel, a jue, a ding, and various types of zun. These illustrations provided a schematic basis for the revival of classical ritual in the early days of the Song court. Now, over the course of the 11th century, roughly 100 years after Nia Chongyi's time, the situation became complicated because of the antiquarian scholarship of figures like Ouyang Shou, Liu Chang, and the aforementioned Liu Dali. Now, all of these figures engaged in one way or another in the study of the physical remnants of the past. As Han Yu, their great patron saint, memorably noted, those things that had been missed in the compilation of the classics and the collation of the histories. Now, there's been ex an explosion of scholarly research on these figures in recent years, and it's clear that they had very different views about what the value of this kind of antiquarian research was. But what they did agree on is that Nia Chongyi's illustrations were wrong. So how were they so sure? Well, actually, it was remarkably simple. The essential reason is that the bronzes that they were looking at were self-naming. They had inscriptions on their surfaces. Here's an example of a vessel that Lou Dalin has identified as an E on the basis of, this is a facing page, a transliteration of the ancient seal inscription that includes the word e in it. So in other words, what, what Song antiquarians realized once they were able to decipher the ancient inscriptions on these vessel surfaces is that they referred to themselves. They said this thing was made by so and so or this gui vessel was made to honor one's ancestors for generations and generations. And so what this demonstrated to Song antiquarians is that the problem of ritual nominalization should not be resolved through reference to textual precedent, but through reference to the self-nominalizing objects themselves. Um, as a taxonomic method, it was elegant in its simplicity. Why go through all of Nia Chongyi's complicated and flawed hermeneutics when all you needed to do was read what was written on the thing itself? And you have to imagine, this is happening in a moment when the Song, Song scholars are engaged in all kinds of empirical research of the, on the natural world. And the great problem of putting the natural world into order is that none of that natural world has any words associated with it. We have to make up words to characterize the world and to sort it into categories. This was the one set of objects that could be empirically observed that provided its own taxonomy. But, as you might imagine, there was a problem or rather two problems. The first problem is the problem of orphaned names. Um, these are names that were featured in the ritual classics, but were not actually found on any bronzes. So an example of this is the term Xing, which we see an illustration of here from Nia Chongyi's uh, Sanli Du, illustrations of the three ritual classics. Now, the Xing is, is identified in the record of rites as a vessel used for holding stew and referred to in the rites of the Zhou as a utensil falling within the purview of stove attendants and stewards who oversaw its use in both general sacrifices and the ceremonial reception of guests. It functions in the Ely in rites conducted when receiving guests, feasting grandees, burying common officers, making food sacrifices, and so forth. Now, all of these classical references ensured that the Xing uh, would become the subject of exegetical commentary and be accorded a place in state-sponsored ritual. The Xing was included among the standard repertoire of sacrificial vessels dictated by the rites of the Kaiyuan period, the great Tang Code from 732, and Nie Chongyi illustrated it as we see here. So, problem number one. Second problem, formal variation. Now, essentially, the challenge is this, that forms with the same name look different in subtle but distinctive ways. The net result of 11th century antiquarian research was to demonstrate that the ancients had applied the same name to objects which varied. One could agree that both of these vessels were cauldrons, but that didn't necessarily answer the question of which cauldron was the right cauldron to copy. Now, there is strong evidence 
to suggest that 11th century literati never actually resolved these problems. For despite the widespread condemnation of Nia Chongyi's illustrations, we still see those illustrations being reproduced in later commentaries in the aftermath of these critiques, such as uh, Chen Changdao's Li Shu from 1078. Now, what we see in the Huizong period bronze is a definitive new approach to both problems. Uh, for one, the Xing has now been unambiguously identified as a cauldron through its conflation with the term ding, or cauldron. Interestingly, Xing ding is actually a neologism that was developed by none other than Nia Chongyi himself as a justification for picturing the Xing as a vessel with three feet. Now, although Huizong's ritualists rejected Nia's image, they accepted the name and they imposed it onto a new vessel, which, through its form and through the imposition of an unmistakable Tautia, would unquestionably and simultaneously be recognizable as a ding, as a cauldron. By calling a bronze cauldron with Tautia motifs a Xing ding, Huizong's court rendered it ritually operable. This made it a rhetorically legitimate model for reformers who rejected the ritual forms of the recent past, but still recognized the authority of the classical texts upon which those forms depended. Eliminating the visual ambiguity of the decor helped to singularize it, which in turn facilitated its one-to-one -one equation with a ritual name. But is this actually a resolution? Isn't this just arbitrary? Didn't they just pick a form? Well, I'm going to actually argue that no, there, there is a basis, there is an intellectual basis, or at least an ideological basis for why this form was chosen. And the reason I think that is because of the profound correspondence we see between the signifying process that we perceive in the design of the bronze and the signifying process expressed in the structure and content of the court's bronze catalog. At the heart of this signifying process is the Book of Changes. Now, the last thing anyone should ever do is five minutes before the end of their talk start talking about the Book of Changes, but um, I'm going to. Um, now, as most of you are no doubt aware, the Book of Changes is essentially a divinatory manual organized around a semiotic system of 64 hexagrammatic signs assembled from combinations of two trigrams. Now, interestingly, one of these trigrams is known as the cauldron hexagram, or dingua. What makes the cauldron hexagram distinctive is that it not only gestures to a series of signifying verbalizations, or shi ci, um, but also to a discrete category of objects distinguished by common formal features. The correspondence between the cauldron hexagram and substantive cauldrons that human beings could see and touch provided a template of formal features through which the hexagram signifying verbalizations could be interpreted. Got that? OK. Um, in terms of classical Persian semiotics, this meant that the cauldron was simultaneously the object of a sign and an interpretant that made the hexagram's other significations meaningful. Now, within this, the signifying verbalizations associated with the cauldron hexagram is the terse statement that cauldron are shang. Now, shang, if you remember, is the term that is typically translated as figure or image, but which I earlier translated as schema. And here's why I think that translation works. If you go through the extensive commentaries on the Book of Changes written during the Song Dynasty, what you will discover is that interpretations of this statement vary quite a bit. One constellation of interpretations associated with the early Neo-Confucian thinkers Zhang Zai, Lu Dalin, and Cheng Yi um, is the idea that the physical design of the cauldron helped to explain the relationship between the cauldron hexagram and the various other material phenomena to which it um, gestured. These explanations were both functional in the sense that the hexagram signified a process, and they were figural in the sense that this hexagram signified a form. I propose schema as a translation for Shang because it accommodates both of these categories. A scheme is a plan or a process for achieving a certain goal. It can also be a figure, such as a schematic drawing, that graphically articulates the constituent elements of a material object, like a house 
or perceptible phenomena like the movement of stars. That schema signifies both the conceptual and the graphic dimensions of this process, echoes the simultaneous conceptualization of Shang as both the sign itself and the process by which it signifies. Now, since all of that was rather abstract and challenging to get one's head around, at least for me, um, let me paraphrase a portion of one of these Northern Song commentaries so you can get a sense of how this worked out in practice. Now, the commentary in question comes from uh, the famous Cheng Yi himself. And I won't read the, his whole commentary. It's far too long. But I'm going to paraphrase here. And so what Cheng Yi says in his commentary, he explains that cauldron is an appropriate name for the hexagram because both the form of a cauldron and the form of the hexagram express the same schematic design. When the six lines of the hexagram are examined together, uh, one observes that the bottom most line is broken just as a gap separates the feet of the cauldron. Counting from the bottom, lines two through four are solid, just as the body of the vessel is solid. Line five is broken, like the holes in the handles. Line six is solid, like the bar slid through those handles to lift the cauldron from the flame. Now, having established the formal coherence between the cauldron hexagram and the schematic design of cauldrons, Cheng Yi proceeds to demonstrate that the signifying verbalizations associated with the hexagram proceed logically from the recognition of the physical cauldron as its referent. Here, the signification of the cauldron shifts from the figural to the functional. He interrogates the logic of the verbalization's assertion that putting wood in fire is cooking. That's a quote. Um, putting wood in fire, he remarks, is actually a scheme for creating fire in general, not specifically for cooking. The reason we can accept the verbalization's assertion that fire signifies cooking in this instance is because the statement is associated with a vessel. Since burning does not require a vessel, but cooking does, fire in reference to a vessel must signify cooking. Thus, the function of the cauldron provides the interpretant whereby Chung Yi demonstrates the coherence of the verbalization, and through that verbalization, the coherence of the book of changes more generally. Got all that? All right. If you don't, don't worry. Um, you can go rat mad reading the Book of Changes. But uh, the key takeaway is that these 11th century commentators essentially agreed that when the Book of Changes said that cauldrons are schema, it was speaking of cauldron as an abstract design, not of specific physical individual cauldrons. Now, what is fascinating is that the authors of Huizong's bronze catalog took the same statement from the Book of Changes and interpreted in literal terms. For them, it wasn't that the design that was a schema, it was the thing itself. The preface to the first section of the catalog, which by default serves as the preface to the catalog as a whole, begins as follows. Of the 64 hexagrams that make up the Zhou Changes, all signify schema but only the cauldron hexagram is itself called a schema. It must be that the sages perceived the profundity of all under heaven, and so sculpted shapes and appearances to schematize its things. It is fitting that for this reason they called them schema. They proceeded to, in close proximity, find schema in their bodies, and more distantly, find schema in the many things. Looking up, they observed them in the heavens as they do. Looking down, they sought them in the earth. By analogizing and scheming their implements, they encompassed comprehensively all the multitudinous things and thus comprehended the virtue of divine clarity and thereby cataloged the sentiments of the myriad things. So what the catalogers are essentially doing is using the Book of Changes as precedent to argue that ancient bronze cauldrons, and indeed all ancient bronzes, were made by the sages in antiquity as a kind of symbolic language to express the normative order of all phenomena. Bronzes in this telling effectively encapsulate the world. By conflating bronzes and hexagrams, they are suggesting that the physical bronzes represent a kind of universal code. What they are saying, if we would borrow a sci-fi analogy, is that bronzes reveal the architecture of the matrix. So cataloging bronzes, therefore, was about much more than organizing a group of ancient things into categories. It was fundamentally about mapping the universe writ large. 
insofar as the catalog succeeded in demonstrating that Hui Zong's court had comprehensively organized all bronzes, it endorsed their assertions of a new ritual order. The rectification of ritual happened not because they had found the right form to emulate. It happened because, through cataloging all ancient forms, they had apprehended the underlying patterns that the sages had sought to express through those forms in the first place. <coughs> Their new ritual implements were operable because they expressed the system through which their collective precedents had been cataloged. Because a catalog is fundamentally about semiotic individuation, a sorting of difference into categories, and about nominalization, a giving of names, it made sense that the cauldron should be too. This diminutive cauldron, in other words, in the minds of its makers, was not just one thing among many, but indeed an embodiment of the epistemological basis for all things. Thank you. Absolutely. And so writing as an abstraction or a condensation of stuff that's not there. Absolutely. And uh, does that get explicit? I, I actually, it does. If you, it, it, it doesn't in the bronze catalog, but they do talk extensively about Sangjie in the painting and calligraphy catalog. So where you see similar, I mean, this sort of, this discourse um, uh, propagates itself across all of the, all of Huizong's cataloging efforts. Okay. And also makes you think of used by Mm, mm. Have, let's say everything on them and made the goat. Right. The right. Pie, right. Like, you know, their game was done. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. No, absolutely. The nine cauldrons do come up. And I mean, Huizong was uh, early on in Huizong's reign, they actually tried to they recast the nine cauldrons. So, so that's absolutely part of the practice as well. It's, it's you know, all of these things do come together. And, and if I had five or six hours, I could talk about it. Do we have any detail about how they went about trying to recapitulate? You know, that's a, you, know, f you mean physically in terms of casting technology or? No, what, or what was the decoration on the tripod like? Uh, that, that is a very good question. We don't have explicit data on that. And of course the tripods themselves don't. But there was, they, they, were, they did get wrapped up in Huizong's reformation of ritual music. Yeah, Joseph. Joseph, if he's, I don't, is Joseph here? I didn't, I didn't see him here. But he's of course the person who, who's, who's written the most extensively. Um, uh, on 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 Huizong's ritual music reforms. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Sure. Um, what did the back of this vessel look like? Oh, sure. We can go back. Sorry. There. There we go. So it's basically, it's basically three registers separated by three vertical flanges with the same identical motif in each. Gotcha. It's very balanced. Thanks. Yeah. And the other question is the, the, the uh, earlier piece, mm. you know, um, maybe my eyes are deceiving me, but the legs look like they have some wood grain on them. Um, am, am I misinterpreting that? Are you, are you looking at... The, 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 hold on, let me find it. No, 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 no. This one? Yes, that one. It's actually incised uh, lines. Oh, okay. They're incised lines that actually recall a plantain leaf motif, a sort of geometricized version of uh, long triangular leaves, which is quite common on early bronze decor. So they're an echo of that. Yeah. So ritualists were, okay. not all antiquarians were. Okay, but so I'm yeah. curious, does that mean that in the earlier periods, they weren't as concerned with there being a one-to-one -one relationship? So, so no, in fact, they were just as concerned about the one-to-one -one relationship. The interesting thing that happens in Hui Zong's time is that the concern with one-to-one -one relationships um, works itself out across both the ritual reproduction and the cataloging. 
So, so the cataloging itself, which we think of as not, a not the same kind of reductive process. If you look at, say, Lou Dahlin's catalog, for example, uh, you know, they, they, he breaks it down into um, uh, you know, basic typological categories, Ding and Zun and Dre and so forth, and just as Huizong's catalog does. But what Huizong's catalog does on top of that is that then it goes through and does all of these symbolic readings of every <coughs> motif on the bronzes and assigns each of those motifs a specific referent. They didn't have that in the earlier catalogs. And I personally think that most, I mean, someone like Lou Dahlin would, if, if my reading of him is correct, uh, would have looked at that and said, that's crazy. Okay. So is that related to like, the larger narrative about Lee and the importance of Absolutely. Science? Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, probably Brooks Zipporin Brooks has written most intelligently about this, about the idea of Lee as a term that's simultaneously about oneness and difference. And um, in what you see, I think really interesting, and if we had more time, a lot of this comes out of Wang Anshur's work as well. Um, the idea that um, the patterns that uh, the, the um, proponents of new learning were seeking was one in which they sought to find that pattern of, of uh, unity and difference in, in all sorts of material phenomena. And so we see this kind of um, cognitive operation working its way through different kinds of sources. And the other question Mm. thinking about the significance of the last, um, I guess, phenomenon that you pointed out, this idea yeah. that the ding actually represents some sort of schema of the world. Mm. Mm. So do you think we have practices like that today where people create objects that are meant to somehow encapsulate the matrix? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, sure. Movie, I mean, lots of things. Okay. Yes. I mean, I don't... I don't works with dumb jobs. Yeah, <laughs> precisely, precisely. I imagine that if we gave everyone in this room a little bit of time, we could come up with an extensive laundry list. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Enjoy your talk. Thank you. It stimulated some thoughts in me. Um, rituals are really um, created by the human mind in a lot of ways. Mm. And it stimulated me to think about it developmentally. Mm. That has to do with the um, Tauti mask. Mm. You know, with infants at about three or four months of age, when you present two eyes and a nose, even on a board in a moving image, they'll smile. Mm. Okay. Mm. And then, uh, that, that, that's a very important developmental achievement in terms of recognizing the mother, the smiling face from mm. the nest. Mm. And then by the time when they get to about seven or eight months, uh, when you present them a, a, a strange face, they would cry. Mm. They would cry inconsolably. Mm. Um, is is the um, is is a not seeing the familiar maternal or caretaker face among mm. the others, mm. and I think that might be you know, it, to me ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Okay, mm, mm, so mm. I look at the individual development at about seven or eight months, stranger anxiety, and think about the um, historical period, the context in which all these art, the creativity, you know, this creations come about. <clears throat> what will those artists or the society struggling that sort of stimulated them to create this monster mask mm. in the vessels mm. that really um, <coughs> is the appeal to and resonated with mm. the observers, mm -hmm. the empress, and mm. all the other people. You know, I guess the way I would respond to that, uh, to your, your question, is that um, the form has never lost its power. The reason that scholars debate so endlessly the iconographic meanings of early bronzes that we don't have contextual evidence to demonstrate is precisely because it still has a hold on us. You don't hear people debating the iconographic meanings of other things, but that face, there's a lot. Um, and. Uh, your, the sort of the psychology of um, perception that you were talking about. I think that, you know, Ernst Gombrich's famous reading of the Tautia is this apotropaic reading where the idea is that if you are, you know, the, you know, the, the basic animal instinct is to see two eyes peering at you out of the jungle and run because that's what predators look like. And, and so that is somehow deeply in our core storage and so as a result, any object that stares at you conveys power, and any object that conveys power conveys importance. If you're interested in reading um, um, 
Bagley has Robert Bagley has a wonderful uh, synopsis of that apotropaic in, 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 um, interpretation in a four-page long footnote in his catalog of the Sackler collection of Chinese bronzes. Um, but that so yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. However, if you start on the uh, ancient bronze. Mm. Mm. And read, let's say, to the left. Mm. You see the creatures in the profile. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And uh, and so that therein therein lies the that therein lies the rub. That's the problem, right? Um, and yet and yet, right. So this would be that would be uh, sort of Lur's rebuttal to Gombrich, probably Max Lur's rebuttal. Because that's what he would say. He would say that it, it, it developed out of um, pattern making, a sort of a, a, a penchant for pattern making, rather than an attempt to convey some sort of deep psychological impulse. Yeah? Mm -hmm. In the previous picture, mm. you have downside side is a BC. Yes. And the right side is also BC. No, the right side is, is AD. AD? Yeah, oh. 2,000 years. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, how come so much, so 2,000 years left and similar picture and also same name? I mean, yeah. last name? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. Well, Can the sages got, why? sure, the sages got it right. <laughs> right? I mean, the problem, the problem is always that, you know, the world was well ordered in 1,000 B.C., and, and, you know, and then the Han happened, and the Tang happened, and the five, not to mention the five dynasties, and the world went to hell. And, and of course you want to go back to antiquity. Antiquity, going back to antiquity is, is uh, the justification for creativity writ large. So, so what you see happening all, I mean, you could say throughout Chinese history, but, but especially in the Song, is, is this sort of way of, of, of wanting to create new solutions to the world's problems, but claiming that those solutions are rooted in antiquity. And the wonderful thing about antiquity is that it's long enough ago and abstract enough that it could be adapted to all sorts of different um, arguments uh, today. So these people are saying vanity? I mean. Actually, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, um, sort of. So, so of course, the song, the song gestures to the Zhou Dynasty, right? But um, what's what's really interesting is that the um, the state of song that that um, survived in Western Zhou times was the place to which the founders of the Zhou Dynasty had settled the remnants of the Shang court, and that state became the um, place name of the region from which two thousand years later the Song founder traced his lineage. So when they found ancient bronzes or ancient bronze bells and were trying to figure out which set of all of these different bells they had found to use as models for the reproduction of court music, they chose the bells that had come from Song because they were Song. So yes, I think there is an attempt to not directly, no one would claim that they were descended from the Shang in, in, in Song times, but at least sort of visually or symbolically to suggest a kind of association. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad that things are still here. But there's something that really bugs me. Okay. But before we get there, um, <laughs> the one on the left is the Shang, right? Mm. I think people generally say that the style changes once you get to the job. Yes. There's a certain amount of rationalization going on there. Yes. So one of the models that the Shang people are using. But looking at this, the question is what is the front and the back of this record? The one on the right has the legs right in the middle mm, between mm, the two eyes. Mm. And is that the case if you rotate it or not? In so other words, is there a front and a back to these vessels? Yes. And then what do you think with Sion? Uh, it seems that even if you rotated the other ones, the legs would never be putting the two eyes. That's right. That's right. That's right. So what is behind the aesthetic uh, choice? I don't like it all. To put uh, the legs immediately underneath the pair of eyes. Yeah, I, so, so I had mentioned that this object has several polytemporal features or anachronistic features. That's another one. Um, I didn't talk about it here. If you want to read about it, uh, Xu Yaohui has, has an interesting article about um, uh, 
the archaism at, uh, in the Song in Artivist Asia, the 2013 issue of Artivist Asia, where she points out precisely that issue as, as, a, distinctive, as a distinctive feature, that the, that the leg, it would never be, well, it, very rarely do you see a leg placed under the chin of the, of the face on an ancient bronze. Um, the fact that now they got really serious about the idea that it is a Exactly, exactly, exactly. It's, it's an interesting question. I don't, have, I don't have an answer for that one. I wish I did, but I will think about it. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. No, oh, yes, sorry. Yes, so you, you, you read it right here, um, right there. So uh, to the military affairs commissioner, Tong Guan, <coughs> Tong Guan was one of the most famous, most powerful eunuchs at Huizong's court. And there comes the question. Mm. So you know, like, you were together in that situation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. To a eunuch. Sure, absolutely. So, <laughs> so, so uh, I, I don't have a definitive answer to that. I have an interpretation um, or, or one possible answer. Um, the, May his descendants treasured for all time is standard verbiage in a bronze inscription. So that's a, that's, this is a phrase, may his descendants treasure it for all time. Uh, mm. That's a very common phrase in ancient bronzes. Um, so, so that was sort of something that would go on a bronze. That was sort of part of the generic vocabulary of a bronze inscription. Right. But um, what I do think Huizong is doing here is, is, is in his own mind, or at least in the court's sort of the hive mind, the, what we can represent of the court, um, is, is trying to resurrect an ancient practice, which was that um, a, a successful ruler would give bronze vessels or give the bronze for the casting of vessels to their retainers as an act of establishing personal bonds between themselves and those retainers that were separate from any sort of bureaucratic administrative bonds between them. So it makes sense in a way because a eunuch wouldn't be part of the same sort of formalized civil administrative structure. He would, he would rely at some sense in the sort of, you know, a, 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 a more informal relationship to the emperor. And that informal relationship is actually echoed in the way that um, uh, uh, figures in, the, in, in ancient times engage with their retainers. So I'm, I think that there may be a kind of echoing of that. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But most of those people were writing after the empire had collapsed, right? I mean, after all of this had all gone to hell and, and, and the Jurchen had, had, had conquered. Yeah, exactly. No, absolutely, absolutely. But it wasn't too long before you get to the southern No, it's just a couple of years. A couple, a couple of years, yeah, yeah. But, you know, if you think from the perspective of uh, Quaidzong's, I mean, Quaidzong's court in the, in the 1110s was hugely ambitious in all sorts of ways. So it makes sense, you know, that, that this wouldn't necessarily be an uh, evidence of critique. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. You, you, you look dissatisfied with my explanation in the back. I, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. <laughs> what, what did you know that this, 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 this Jewish has been, you know, so much that he said, be careful, don't be greedy, you're my friend now. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, 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 so I, guess, I guess what I would say is that they haven't succeeded in eliminating multivalence. Um, and on that note. <laughs>